The health and safety of our community and staff members are at the forefront of our minds as we continue to navigate county business in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Today's meeting is a hybrid board meeting. Some presenters and guests will appear in person and some will appear virtually. For those presenting virtually, please mute your mic when not speaking. When presenting, make sure to unmute your mic and turn on your camera. For all presenters, please state your name for the record before speaking or responding to questions. Okay, doesn't look like we have anything on the consent agenda, so we will move on to public testimony. Marina. <clears throat> Opportunity for public comment on non-agenda matters. This is a time for the board to hear public testimony and offer board deliberation. Um, we received one written testimony, which was shared with board members and staff. We also um, received one virtual and um, three um, in-person public testimony. Um, I'll start with the virtual. Uh, Sam Bowman, I'm gonna unmute you. Sam, are you there? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, you may begin, you have three minutes. Okay, um, hello commissioners, my name is Sam Bowman. I'm a case manager with Transition Projects or TPI, one of the largest contractors running emergency and residential shelters in the county. I'm speaking today as a member of our employee union, TPI Workers United, APSME Local 88-3. Um, currently, we're in contract bargaining with our management, and while we've made a wage proposal, uh, management has been telling us for nearly two months that they're waiting on budget numbers from the Joint Office of Homeless Services before making a counter proposal. Um, today, I just wanna read some further testimonials from TPI union members. Uh, this is from a resource specialist working at the TPI Resource Center in Old Town, quote, when we are not paid a living wage to do this work, it becomes difficult. This job can also be dangerous. I have personally been grabbed, chased, and had participants throw punches at me during mental health crises. I've seen good, caring coworkers quit because we aren't making enough for the level of care we provide, and other agencies offer starting wages way higher than TPI. We love our jobs, but we are also living paycheck to paycheck as the cost of rent soar, and it is completely unsustainable. Uh, this is from a support worker at a deeply affordable apartment complex. In my life, I have had many jobs. None have been as challenging or rewarding as my work at TPI. At my current wage, I have nothing left over after rent, utilities, fuel, and groceries, nothing. I live alone and live paycheck to paycheck despite my commitment to helping people experiencing mental health crisis, active addiction, and the traumas that go along with disenfranchised and vulnerable populations. I, one person, work with 72 residents as support to their needs. Uh, this is from a former residential advocate at one of our shelters. Quote, I started as an RA here even before COVID, making around $15 an hour. While providing services like listening to someone tell me their recent relapse story while I myself was also struggling with recovery, tell me about their experiences with death, domestic violence, sexual assault and heartbreak, checking participants breathing to make sure they were alive, breaking up fights and then add COVID on top of that I was also in the lines for the food bank, sleeping at the library, and trying to juggle multiple jobs, just trying to survive. $15 an hour is not enough. No wages at TPI are enough for frontline workers. And lastly, this is from another shelter residential advocate. I also reach out to those who are continuing to argue that our wage is sufficient, that it's enough for the overwhelming responsibility and workload that comes with our line of work, and ask that you look within yourselves. Services are already declining as more employees lose the ability to continue pouring their efforts into an organization that doesn't appear to care about their livelihood, end quote. Uh, commissioners, I urge you and your program managers to listen to these voices and value the work that these people are doing and would like to keep doing. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Next, we have injured and pissed off. My name's injured and pissed off, and my real name is injured and pissed off. Some people ask me what my real name is after I show them my ID, and I assure them that it's real. Even the police have asked me, is that a real ID? And I go, well, of course it is. I wouldn't show a police officer a fake ID. Uh, I walked over here from my apartment building, 
I live at the Hamilton West in downtown Portland. That's up by PSU. And there's citizens there that's elderly, like myself. And uh, these two people that live on the same floor that I do, in apartment 215 and uh, apartment uh, 213, I think is what it is, or it could be uh, 212. Anyways, one's a Marine that's 80 years old, and I tell people, you better be nice to her because she was a Marine. And uh, Jim Lang, he lives in 215, uh, and he's heavy set, bigger than, than I am, heavier. And of course, he's got health issues. Uh, he's been troubled by this uh, heat wave, and of course, they put up notices on the doors about air, free air conditioners, but I'm afraid that with this heat uh, that's gonna be Sunday at 97 degrees, he's as pale as this white cane here, uh, he's gonna be in severe trouble if he doesn't get that air conditioner installed. Uh, apparently they think that just uh, going down to the lobby where it's cool, that they can live like that during the heat strain and if he passes away, or she does, the Marine, uh, it'll be up on your consciences. Uh, they should have air conditioning uh, uh, provided in those buildings for those people. Of course, I'm saying medical issues, not, not just because it's comfortable. Uh, it's a life and death situation. Uh, there were 70 people that passed away last year, apparently, from one of the heat waves. and uh, That was just in McNoma County, I believe it was. Uh, I'm also here to, to say that USA, that when I talked July 14th, saying that USA must stand for us assholes, that I was implying that if a blind person that has a service animal, it would be bad enough if I had fallen and just broken my hip and fractured two of my vertebrae in my spinal cord. But what had happened is that the city, county, state, and federal government wanted it that way. And that's the reason why I'm injured and pissed off. Thank you for coming. Uh, Simcha Charles Bridge Crane Johnson. Good morning, Madam Vice Chair and all y'all. Um, happy World Breastfeeding Month. Oops, so far, international programs only have breastfeeding week. That'll be coming up as R5, but um, I think that's something that uh, we can feel positive about. I, there's not gonna be a lot of positivity in the rest of my talk, but um, this county and our country, the world generally, are doing better at supporting uh, women. Of course, right now, it's unfortunate for mothers because it's a crisis of necessity. Uh, our country cannot get adequate baby formula to women who are parenting. Uh, and so that adds a little extra, I don't know, twist to the uh, fact that later on on R5, we'll be talking about uh, World Breastfeeding Week. Um, sometimes I just critique the way you word uh, things. Sorry, Maria. Um, but uh, when we come to R4 and it says resolution authorizing the issuance and sale of the full faith and credit financing agreements, it would really be better for us, your constituents and taxpayers, if that could have been expanded to say how much new debt we're putting out and what's the current total indebtedness in the county. I'm sure that'll be in the presentation and we could wait and get those nitty gritty details. But I think that, you know, if the financing is important, debt issuance is necessary, it would be even a, we'd hit an even higher bar if it said we're issuing 900 million or 1.2 billion or whatever than uh, this year's series 22 financing is. Um, I didn't bring up a prop, but uh, I have an Obama phone. It looks like I've only made about seven calls on my Obama phone. Um, two of those are to Pennsylvania. I didn't make them. 
They were made by people in distress to their parents in Pennsylvania. Uh, one of these persons had an experience where they were excluded from the library after our call, it was on a different day. The other person is at the MAX station, uh, pretty visibly having some you know, personal growth experiences around their gender identity, and also carrying a, pushing a broken baby stroller that includes sort of the new logo of our county, a piece of tin foil with smoked blues on it. Blues, of course, being opiates. Um, I'm not really living a life where I'm uh, able to fully interface with these people and help them connect with supports, but I did what I could. So two out of my seven calls are to people who somehow made it from Pennsylvania to come be in crisis uh, in our county. Uh, it's, uh, everyone needs support. I'm not a big fan of when we bus people back to their home territories, uh, place of origin. You know, I've, I'm here thriving uh, in my own way after 10 years, but the crisis is deep and severe if two out of seven calls on my phone are to people reaching out to their parents in Pennsylvania. And you know, at, the li at Central Library, there was uh, money allocated for a social worker to be near the entrance. That's, I don't know that that was ever covered in the plan to close the library. All those people who maybe had periodic repeat interactions with that library social worker, did we miss how to support them and where they can, you know, they can go to TPI. We just heard from Sam Bowman, who does a great job or did a great job at KBU. I'm not up to date on who's doing what at KBU. Um, but that bit about TPI workers is, uh, very serious, and I want to point out that last week we talked, we got, we're giving the people that we rent space for the library 3% guaranteed increase on their lease. We don't even know what the consumer price index is going to be like during that period of time. So if we can't give our employees guaranteed 3% raises, we should not be giving them to landlords where we're storing books. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Lightning Super Karma. Yes, my name is Lightning. I represent Lightning Super Karma. One of the reasons why I want to take the name Multnomah off Multnomah County, Oregon, is that when I keep doing speeches on all the negative things that are done by the leaders of Multnomah County, I want to make it very clear to the indigenous people, I show you no respect, but highly respect to you. You're, you're very respected. And in my opinion, the land back movement needs to be a reality. And by me just setting your name aside when I'm speaking negative things is showing you respect. We're on their land. We took their land by violence, by blatant lies, by treaties that are fraudulent. And then we want to acknowledge them by their name on the county, by their name on the county jails. I myself don't approve of that, and I think the, a lot of the indigenous people would agree with me on that. Give them back their land, then put their name on their own land. Now, referring to some of the negative things in Multnomah County, you overpaid the homeless camp $500,000, double dipping in the accounts of the people that work hard and pay taxes and want their money to go as far as it can. Double invoices, you missed it. How do you miss that? If you own a business in the private sector and somebody is handing you one invoice, they get paid, then three months later they say, hey, I'm not doing good on cash flow, they hand you another one, they get paid, and then they continue to do that, up to $500,000, and again, how they were caught like a criminal in a bank. 
They were caught on the hotline, the good government hotline. Somebody felt decent enough, and I commend whoever that was. And I'm asking Multnomah, or no name county, to pay them a 10% fee for their outstanding work of that money recovered. $50,000 to that person, I'm asking. They deserve every penny. That would have never been caught. They would have made 525000 And you all would have been sitting here going, well, gee, you know, we run the county, but we don't know what we're doing. That's what that demonstrates. That's why I removed the name Multnomah County off that name in respect to the indigenous people. I'm not showing you disrespect. I'm pointing out the fact that these people missed that. How do you miss that? How do you miss that? Thank you for- No name county. Thank you for your time. I will now move on to R1. R1. Notice of intent for the health department to apply for $9,809,194 per year for three years for the HRSA service area competition. So moved. Commissioner Jayapal moves. Commissioner Myron seconds. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. How are you? For the record, my name is Adrienne Daniels. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the interim executive director of Integrated Clinical Services, which serves as the community health center for Multnomah County. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Anirudh Padmala. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the deputy director for Integrated Clinical Services. We're here this morning to ask for your permission to apply for our regular three-year service area application grant to the HRSA Federal Community Health Center Program. This grant is approximately $9.8 million and helps us provide services to patients who are uninsured and underinsured throughout the entire Multnomah County region. This past year, the health center has provided support and guidance to all persons who need help through COVID-19, in addition to seeking regular primary care, dental, and pharmacy services. We're proud to continue this application and history of providing high quality care to anyone who needs it in Multnomah County. This federal grant helps us provide uh, dozens of um, staffing salaries and support throughout our frontline workers, as well as quality assurance positions um, for our services. Are there questions regarding this grant? Thank you. Commissioner Myron, questions, comments? I, I do not have any questions. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Jayapal. No questions. Thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Welcome aboard. It's great to see you here and have you testify. Um, and I don't have any questions. It's a great and, and necessary grant. Thank you. And I don't have any questions either. Just keep up the good work. We appreciate all that you do to serve our community. Marina, would you take a roll call vote? Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Vice Chair Stegman? Aye. The NOI is approved. Thank you. Thank you for coming. R2, notice of intent for NOAA Fisheries Fish Passage Grant for Troutdale Road Culvert Replacement on Beaver Creek. Commissioner Good morning, Vega, Trooper you, Furry. Oh, hang on one second, please. Uh, Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Myron seconds. Approval of R2. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Good morning, Trooper Furry and Commissioners. My name is Roy Ewi. I'm with the Water Quality Program of the Transportation Division in the Department of Community Services. I'm here to seeking your approval to submit a grant application for the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration's Fish Passage Restoration Grant. This grant would be used for a uh, culvert on Troutdale Road. This is a culvert on Beaver Creek, which is a salmon bearing stream in Troutdale. This culvert was built in 1932 and has a fish ladder built in 1953. Both pieces are undersized and, and failing. And so we need to replace this culvert to uh, help the migration of adult and juvenile salmon upstream and downstream of this creek. Uh, this creek supports coho salmon, chinook salmon, and steelhead trout, which are all listed on the Federal Endangered Species Act. We've had uh, two other successful culvert programs, as you may know, um, on Stark Street and Cochrane Road. These are two of the uh, crossings upstream of Dogdale Road, and uh, we 
taking place those in 2017 and 2019. And now we are seeking funding for this third culvert, which is just downstream of those two, to allow the full passage of these salmon species uh, in this creek. Uh, this is a three-year grant with the possibility of two one-year extensions. The total cost is $10 million approximately. And um, uh, we were very excited to have this opportunity to uh, to submit this grant. This is apparently a once in a generation opportunity. So I appreciate your support. Any questions I'd be happy to answer. Thank you, Roy. Commissioner Vega-Peterson. Thanks so much, Roy. And it would be really great to have this culvert in and have the fish, pa fish passage totally clear. Um, so good luck with the grant. Commissioner Jaipal. Thank you, Roy. Um, no questions. It's a, it does sound like a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Commissioner Myron. Ditto, ditto. Thank you, Roy. Uh, Roy, I had a question. You mentioned that uh, it's a possibility that we would uh, extend this grant. So is an extension in addition to the 10 million? Uh, the extension would be in time. Oh, in so the time. It's gotcha. very difficult to uh, complete a project in three years, as you imagine, of this size. And so um, the grant does allow for two one-year extensions. And uh, in this grant, we actually are um, suggesting that we will take advantage of one of those extensions, a one-year extension, so that uh, the process could be free of the kinds of constraints uh, with the time. Fish passage uh, is difficult because there's a certain window of opportunity where you need to actually be in the stream. This is called an in-work uh, uh, water window. And so if we can't get a project within that time, then we have to wait another year. And so uh, that may be a possibility. And so we're outlining that in the grant area. So. Well, that's good, Roy. Thank you. I know that you've um, given me a tour of like the Stark Street culvert. And for those of you who've never uh, seen work uh, in streams, uh, there's a lot that goes into it about when there can be building, when there can't be. Uh, but it's really exciting to see uh, fish and salmon coming back to um, East Multnomah County. So thank you for the work. All right, the board clerk will now take a roll call vote. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Vice Chair Stegman? Aye. The NOI is approved. Thank you, Roy. Thank you. R3, notice of intent to apply for $44.7 million from the FY 2022 Bridge Investment Program grant for the construction phase of the Earthquake Ready Burnside Bridge project. So moved. Second. Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Jayapal seconds. Approval of R3. Welcome, Megan. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Megan Neal. I'm the project manager for the Earthquake Ready Burnside Bridge project. I'm back in front of you requesting approval to apply for a $447 million grant from the Bridge Investment Program grant coming out of the Biden infrastructure package. This grant is specifically geared towards bridges that are in poor or deteriorating condition. And so we want to take advantage of this opportunity and try to fully fund the construction project with this grant. Uh, just as a reminder, we are seeking $600 million to fully fund this proje project and this $447 million will go to the construction phase and will get us um, a great leap there. Uh, should we be successful in this grant, we would um, spend it over the FY25 uh, through 30 time period and our local match would be provided by the county's vehicle registration fee. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Megan. Marina, do we have any public testimony? No, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner Myron, any questions, comments? I do not. This would go a long way. Um, so thank you, Maggie. Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Megan. I may have missed it, but um, did you mention when we expect to hear back? This one, I'm thinking early spring of next year. Okay, great. Well, good luck. Thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Yeah, these are such important grants for the for the um, for this project. So I'm very excited that there are a lot of opportunities at the federal level, and just wish you the best of luck. Thanks. 
Fantastic. We're going to have a funded bridge. That's really exciting. Good work, Megan. All right. Uh, the, uh, hopefully we will. Uh, the board clerk will now take a roll call vote. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jeppel? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Vice Chair Stegman? Aye. The NOI is approved. Thank you, Megan. R4, resolution authorizing the issuance and sale of full faith and credit financing agreement series 2022. So moved. Second. Commissioner Jayapal moves. Commissioner Vega Peterson seconds. Approval of R4. Welcome, Eric and Jamie. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, Eric Ariano, Chief Financial Officer, and I have with me uh, Jamie Watts, Director. Department of County uh, Community Services. And I'm here to request your approval to authorize me to obtain financing for the earthquake ready Burnside Bridge in the amount of $25 million, $250,000. Uh, this request grants me the authority to move forward with the financing process, which takes around uh, a little bit less than two months from beginning to end in terms of that process. Uh, Oregon Revised Statute 271 and 287 grant us the authority to move forward with the financing for certain capital projects and sets thresholds around how we do that. And this request meets those, those revised statutes. Um, the specific purpose is obviously to fund the Burnside Bridge project, but is to fund 30% of the design and right of way phase, which will be carried out throughout the fiscal year 23. Um, and this is currently in our fiscal year 2023 budget um, the Burnside Bridge has about 51 million budgeted currently of which for this year of which 25 million is going to be financed with this request. Um, in terms of uh, a process, I've been working with our county council, our bond council and our financial advisors over the last couple weeks, looking at different um, structuring options, different methods of sale for the financing process. And what I'm recommending today is that we move forward with the, what we call a full faith and credit direct bank placement loan. And that it's not a, a public sale, this is a direct loan with the bank. And under this process, we think that it'll, it'll um, reduce the amount of interest we'll pay over the term of the loan, and also gives an opportunity to save some costs in terms of the issuance, um, as this process is, is, is less administrative work to actually do a loan than actually do a public sale. And usually we go with the, a sale of bonds in a traditional issuance because um, they tend to be cheaper, um, but this is a shorter term loan that we're looking at. And also the bond market's been a little volatile right now. And so we, we did some outreach with some uh, banks um, to see to poke interest. And um, it seemed like a better option that we will be seeing in terms of potential proposals. So in terms of how this process works is we actually prepare what we call a term sheet, which kind of lays out the purpose uh, specific parameters that we're requesting with the financing. Uh, we make this available in terms of, of, of like an RFP process, and then we get bids from interested banks, um, and then we evaluate those bids and then select the, the bank that we that fits our needs and gives us the, the cheapest option in terms of the process. So in terms of the timeline for that, um, we're actually looking to, sub if you approve this today, We'll make available those um, those RFPs later this month. We'll get some bids later this month, and then we'll start that evaluation process at the end of at the, uh, end of August. And then, uh, hopefully, based on the plan that we have, that will close out the the financing at the end of September, which will make the funds available um, to the project team to Megan and our project team in early October. Which that's when the the design and right away work for this year is really going to ramp up in terms of process. Um, the term of the loan is going to be 10 years, and it's going to be supported by VRF revenues. Um, this is the $37 increase that the board approved a couple years ago that will support um, the debt service for this project. This does not impact our internal policy around debt service that could be supported by general funds, as this is being supported by the vehicle registration fee um, for, for this issuance. So. Um, Again, this request is just to grant me authority to move forward with the financing process for um, the issuance of $25 million. I will note that the request is for $25,250,000. We're going for $25 million. It's just this gives us additional um, room in case something uh, happens through that process, but we're actually doing $25 million. Um, is our current plan. So I'm going to pass it over to Jamie to kind of give an update as to the timeline of where we're at with the project. 
but also give some information around some of the efforts around um, kind of um, you know seeking those other funding options for the long term of the project, the construction phase, um, and get an update on that. So, morning, Vice Chair Stegman, Commissioners. I'm Jamie Waltz. So I use she/her pronouns, and I'm the director for the Department of Community Services. Um, just to put this particular um, piece into the context. Um, we will be issuing our record of decision by the end of this year, which culminates all of the work that we've done through the environmental impact um, and NEPA phase. So it's quite a milestone for us. Um, with this bonding of the 25 million, it will get us through the ability to start the first 30% of design. We're estimating that the design phase may be about 130 million total. So this first segment will allow us to continue our efforts to identify revenue for the construction phase, which we anticipate starting in 2025. We will be coming back in a year to ask for um, more bonding authority for the remainder of the um, design phase. Um, I think it's perfect timing that Megan had the notice of intent today. We actually, um, with this submission of the Bridge Investment Program grant at $447 million, we will have submitted a total of $987 million in grant requests to date. Um, we're hoping to hear back this month for the $5 million raise grant submission we put in, a, I can't remember when, a while ago, um, hoping to hear it this month. And then um, we also, back in May, put in for the um, multimodal project discretionary grant program, and we're hoping, that was $535 million, and we're hoping to hear around November for um, if we were successful in that award. There are some uh, additional grants that we're waiting for the, the information to come out um, either this fall that we will go after. In addition to looking at what federal grants are available, we're working with our Office of Government Relations and our project team to identify where we can look under every rock for um, additional funding. As Megan had said, we're looking to um, bridge that 600 million gap um, that is in a, would be in addition to the 300 million that we've raised for the vehicle registration fee. So I guess we'll open up for any questions or comments on the request. All right, thank you so much. Marina, do we have any public testimony? No, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Vega-Peterson. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, thank you both for um, the presentation and for working on the, well, you too, Megan, um, and um, for just working on this. I think that this is um, an interesting way. I appreciate you kind of looking into our, what the traditional mechanism has been, but that, that this might be a better deal for the county. Um, and just, um, I'm glad to be able to move forward with, um, you know, bonding this first part for the design fund and knowing that we have additional funds allocated for the rest of the design phase. Um, I am just curious, um, in terms of like the grant pieces of it, um, I know some of them are, you know, there's been such a variety of, of federal dollars that have been allocated for transportation. Some of them are very like specific to seismic, some of them are specific to bridges, some of them are ge more general. Um, like, do we have any idea of which ones we think we are the best positioned for? Megan, do you want to take, I want to say we're all, we're positioned really well for all of that's them. A great, I think that's a great <laughs> answer, yes. <laughs> Megan, do you have anything to add? We've certainly are targeting the grants we feel we are going to be the most competitive because it does take a lot of effort and consultant time to put the grants together. But at the end of the day, um, it is really, um, takes a village to win a grant. It's not just the grant, but it's also the support from elected officials and regional agency partners and our government relations staff to advocate for our project. So we, I feel like we have done a great job on all of those fronts. So we'll just see how the chips fall and at least we'll get some feedback and um, to understand ways where we could maybe try again and do better next time. Well, I appreciate, I know that there's been a lot of hard work. I know that there's been a lot of meetings that we've like that I've participated in to try to like put us in the best position for this so I just uh, appreciate this and again um, this you know the financing piece is helping us through this phase but we really need to get the whole thing done so thank you Commissioner Jayapal thank you vice chair segment um, thank you and I appreciated the briefing that I got earlier this week as well I, I think you know um, 
So one thing that we did talk about then that I think it would be helpful to, to talk about in public as well is, is the question of the, the timing of design, construction, and getting finance, you know, trying to get the financing for the construction and moving forward on the design at the same time. So could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, the fact that we are investing in design without knowing whether we have funds for construction, but that we have a time frame that, that gives us a cushion to, to continue to move forward with this if we don't get that financing right away. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll start and then Megan, if you have anything to add. I think, you know, there's um, a lot of hope and optimism that as we get further in the design, even though we don't have all of the construction funds shored up right now, um, that we can continue to build on the momentum with having the design. And as we move towards the design, we have the, you know, 895 million planning cap for the bridge, but as we move towards design, we get clearer and clearer on the, the cost of the project. And what, what we're anticipating and hoping, you know, not to happen is that there's no gap and we can just flow into construction in 2025. If for some reason we're not successful with all these grants and we still need to delay the construction part of the project, Having the design work completed and the NEPA phase, it has a shelf life, so it's not like it, or sorry, it doesn't have, you know, it has like a 10 year window where we um, can still, it'll stay fresh. And so, you know, we know that every year delay, the cost of construction and project will go up, but it does give us time to continue to refine our strategy for revenue generation. So we did put in some, um, for lack of a better term, kind of stop gap milestones to make sure that before we go for the next phase of bonding that we're, you know, this much farther with where we're at with um, raising revenue for the construction phase. It's really helpful and, I, you know, I think everybody recognizes how critical this project is so that that gives us some cushion and it's not, a, I, I don't feel we have an option. We have to move forward on this and this is a really thoughtful way of doing that. So, thank you. Commissioner Myron. Thank you, um, and thank you, Eric and Jamie and Megan again. Uh, and I, I really appreciate Commissioner Jayapal's question. Um, it, I'm a big fan of working on things concurrently whenever possible instead of um, in sequence, which just extends everything that we do. Um, but we, we know we need to ensure that there is that cushion and that we are, un that it will work when we're doing that. And I appreciate your thoughtfulness and your response about how we're making sure that that happens um, during this process. So um, that is it, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, I did have one question. So I think you all mentioned, uh, so it's the $37 for the VRF that is funding or securing the bond. But I think, Jamie, you mentioned that potentially you would all be coming back uh, to ask for additional bonding. So I'm just kind of wondering, is there a formula for the capacity of what that $37 VRF uh, represents and how much additional capacity do we have? Yeah, it, 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 and this is a, a rough estimate. It, it can vary based on the how interest rates uh, go. But uh, right now, our our um, the thirty seven dollars our estimates have been over a twenty year bond um, that it gives us a roughly around a little bit over three hundred million in bonding power um, to finance again the design the design and right away phase into construction. So. Great. That's what, what Jamie was referencing, the, okay. the 300 to the 900, that difference at 600 million that we're still working to, right. to, to fund. Yeah, I Great. think Megan Thank mentioned that, yeah. And just to add, I think that the debt payment, we don't know for sure, but the debt payment on this 25 million is roughly, do you remember? About 2 million a year, yep. Great, Thank you so much. All right, uh, let's see, the board clerk uh, will now take a roll call vote. Commissioner Myron. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Vice Chair Stegman? Aye. The NOI is approved. Thank, Thank you. you very much. R5, proclaiming August 1st through the 7th, 2022 as World Breastfeeding Week in Multnomah County, Oregon. <laughs> Commissioner Myron moves. Commissioner Vega-Peterson seconds. Approval of R5. And I think we have some virtual presenters.
Buenos dias. Good morning. Good morning. Commissioner Vega Peterson, Commissioner Jaya Paul, Commissioner Myron, and Commissioner Stegman. My name is Veronica Lopez Erickson. I am the Interim Nutrition Programs Manager and an International Board Certified Lactation Consultant. I'm excited to be here today to celebrate the proclamation of World Breastfeeding Week this first week of August and honoring Black Breastfeeding Week the fourth week of the month. We are celebrating the resiliency and efforts towards chest and breastfeeding in our Black communities, our Indigenous Native communities, and all our diverse communities at Multnomah County. In response to the racial health disparities in chest breastfeeding rates and their exacerbation with the formula shortage, we have increased our efforts to support chest and breastfeeding and to expand our lactation counseling services. We have partnered with the REACH team in promotion of Step Up for Breastfeeding, which is today's proclamation theme and latter event. All our WIC staff are dedicated to supporting chest and breastfeeding. Thank you to our breastfeeding counselors, our nutrition assistants, and our dietitians, our front desk staff and call center staff. We provide culturally specific lactation support by individual contact and through groups and classes. We have started to develop the vision of a chest breastfeeding medicine center for holistic healing, support, and advocacy. This is groundbreaking and so exciting. Next, we will hear from my colleagues at our WIC Breastfeeding Support Services, Ms. Sabrina and Ms. Cherish. Thank you to our WIC staff, to our partners at REACH, and to you, our Board of County Commissioners. Gracias, Ms. Good morning. My name is Sabrina Vilmanay, and I'm so thankful to be here before our esteemed commissioners. Thank you for this, once again, for this opportunity to share on a topic that is near and dear to my heart as a mother who has breastfed her children and also as an international board certified lactation consultant and breastfeeding support provider for the past 20 years. Today, my colleague, Cherish and I will share some highlights of what Multnomah County REACH racial and ethnic approaches to community health program and our women, infant and children WIC program have, have been working to do to support our breastfeeding families in the community. I'm going to ask that my slides be uh, shared. Thank you for that. And if we can go to slide two. What is REACH and why do we care about Black breastfeeding? Today, I'm going to be talking about our concerted efforts and work thus far in the REACH program and also our future plan efforts. REACH focuses on three main domains physical activity, community clinical linkage, and nutrition. Within the nutrition domain, one strategy includes increasing continuity of care and community support for breastfeeding. REACH hopes to increase breastfeeding rates in the Black community to ensure our Black babies have an opportunity to sustain the long-term positive health outcomes that result from being breastfed. What have we done thus far? We have been working diligently to respond to the community feedback that we've received and recommendations. Some of the work that we have successfully implemented includes installing mobile breastfeeding tents in the community, hosting a breastfeeding campaign photo shoot, we were able to successfully advocate for breastfeeding space at the new Rockwood Rising Marketplace building. We hosted a men's barbershop talk and recorded several radio and video PSAs and have planned a series of events for the month of August, which is National Breastfeeding Awareness Month. Okay, I found future planned efforts. Much of our efforts this past year have been focused on community awareness, including a focus on maternal education, 
father involvement, destigmatizing breastfeeding, and increasing access and awareness around breastfeeding. This upcoming year, we will be focusing more specifically on employers and policy and systems and environmental changes. One of those initiatives includes an implicit bias bill, which focuses on healthcare providers that we are considering drafting for the Oregon legislator. Let me tell you a little bit about the bill. The idea for the implicit bias bill was sparked by the state of California's recent passing of a similar bill, Senate Bill Number 464. The bill was the bill was an effort to address Black maternal disparities. The bill would require hospitals providing perinatal care, alternative birth centers, and primary clinics to impl implement an evidence-based implicit bias program as specified for all healthcare providers involved in perinatal care of patients with those facilities. Next slide, please. I want to share a little bit about our community partners. We are so fortunate to have many great community partners that stand beside us as we work towards reducing black health disparities. I just want to share a few highlights of, of our partners. The African American Breastfeeding Coalition. Um, they have been leading us as we connect and engage with the black community around breastfeeding and its importance. Healthy birth initiatives. They have been providing mothers of, of color with culturally specific support um, and, and mental and physical wellness information and training for years. And we're so happy to be partnered with them. The Black Parent Initiative, Sacred Roots Doulas Program, which provides mothers and um, families with consistent care, reassurance, comfort, and encouragement. City of Gresham Redevelopment Commission, which have been our partners in advocating for lactation space at the new Rockwood Rising Market Hall. Our local Black barber shops, including Influential, Champions, and Infinity, which have partnered with us in the efforts to engage men in the breastfeeding journey. Urco Africa House, who have partnered with us to host focus groups to address challenges that face immigrant um, families of color. The Urban League of Portland, who have been working beside us as we connect and engage with black community members around breastfeeding and its importance. Um, WIC, Women, Infant, and Children Nutrition Program, their breastfeeding services team have been instrumental in supporting and advocating for our Black breastfeeding families and supporting REACH in their efforts to, su to support the breastfeeding and lactating community. And last but not least, the Multnomah County Library and BCLA who have been solid partners working to connect with the Black community to increase access and utilization of Multnomah County Libraries. Next slide, please. So how, how do we do it? Normalize breastfeeding. In an effort to increase breastfeeding rates in our community, according to the CDC, Black mothers have the lowest rate of breastfeeding initiation and duration rates in our, in our nation. This is unfortunate because the benefits of breastfeeding for both mom and baby are numerous. REACH is launching an employer-focused breastfeeding campaign this year. The campaign is focused on normalizing breastfeeding by providing community support and encouragement for Black mothers. We recognize that fathers and males um, partners as well as family members are active contributors to the success of sustained breastfeeding. For this reason, we have engaged men as key components of this campaign. 
We hope to create a holistic and inclusive campaign that includes male perspective and empowers mothers to choose breastfeeding across diverse settings. And so next slide, please. Here's a picture of uh, REACH and APCO's lactation station. Um, this lactation station has been erected throughout the county. Um, the specific purpose of it is for us to have spaces available for um, lactating families um, to feed their children in a comfortable area and space, not in a bathroom, not in a hot car, or deal with any uncomfortable uh, stairs from public members. So this lactation station debated in June on Juneteenth um, 2019 and has made its appearance at many other community events throughout the county. Um, I just want to pause and thank Ms. Charlene McGee and Michaela Hill for sharing uh, this information. And I will hand it over, turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Cherish Wanters, um, nutrition assistant, to continue the rest of the presentation. Cherish. Thank you, Ms. Sabrina. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Cherish Wanter, and I'm the WIC Nutrition Program Specialist for our Black, or African American, African Immigrant, and Native American communities. I'll be continuing the rest of this presentation. As Ms. Sabrina previously mentioned, the Rockwood Rise in Breastfeeding Space is one of Reach's successful projects for this year. The City of Gresham Redevelopment Commission partnered with the REACH program to successfully advocate for a lactation space at the new Rockwood Rising Market Hall development. REACH and APCO, which is the African American Breastfeeding Coalition, will unveil the space to the community at the end of the month. Next slide, please. REACH, Black Parent Initiative, Wake and Healthy Birth, and Healthy, well, and Healthy Birth Initiative, and the African-American Breastfeeding Coalition are collaborating with the Port of Portland in efforts to make the airport a lactation-friendly public space. With two new rooms added this year, PDX Airport now has four lactation rooms. We found each room equipped with ample counter space, electrical outlets, a sink, and a tax chair to assist moms when breastfeeding. In addition, the rooms are designed with soothing colors, lighting, and artwork. All four rooms are also ADA compliant and accessible. We plan to develop and incorporate evergreen messaging and communications materials throughout the airport. Lastly, the REACH program will assist with supplies such as artwork, small tables, and additional seating for children as needed. Next slide, please. Now I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the WIC program. The Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children more commonly known as WIC, as a public health nutrition program that supports income eligible households with pregnant women, postpartum women, and or infants and children between the ages of zero to five. WIC provides nutrition education classes, breastfeeding promotion and support, breast pump in certain circumstances, monthly benefits for certain healthy foods, and referral to other support programs. Next slide, please. WIC also provides culturally specific services for our families. These include culturally specific breastfeeding peer groups available in English and Spanish. And our breastfeeding peer groups are available to clients of the REACH and HBR program, as well as members of the public. African immigrants, African American, and indigenous families may request a staff member within their cultural group to complete the WIC appointments. Our nutrition education classes are also available in other languages, including Somali, Amharic, Korean, Russian, and many more. And lastly, we have a board certified lactation consultant, Ms. Sabrina, who provides training within WIC, REACH, HBI, and the community to improve culturally specific virtual and in-person services. She continues to provide in-person services throughout the pandemic to ensure our mothers receive the care they need. This is the end of our presentation. Now I want to call on Ms. Veronica and, and Mr. Teardo 
McAuley, they will be sharing their recent experience with receiving white first reading services. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much, Sharice. Thank you, Ms. Sabrina, for having us today. Um, so my name is Veronica, and this is my husband. I'm Ted. Thank you so much for having us today. Um, so when we got pregnant, the plan was to breastfeed initially. We were very excited to just jump into the breastfeeding game, not knowing that it was more than what we expected. Initially, I thought that breastfeeding would just be me putting my baby on the breast and then instantly she would start feeding. But I realized early on that it took more than that. Yeah. So that is when I picked up the phone and I called Wick. I was screaming, I said, I need help, I don't know what to do. And instantly they referred me to the incredible Miss Sabrina. And we went to see her and she was so amazing. She helped us and taught me how to latch the, the baby properly and instructed me the best way possible I could, you know, have my baby feed while I was also comfortable because I was feeding my baby, but at the detriment of myself where I was in constant pain. So her education and her guidance has helped me today to say that, okay, I'm finally feeding my baby without being in tears. So I'm so grateful for the WIC program and I hope that it continues for mothers like me. My husband and I are so blessed that this program even exists, that the breastfeeding program even exists, that people like Miss Sabrina are there to guide and to help us, you know, to know exactly what we are doing. I have um, baby Proverbs here. As you can see, Aww. she's sleeping and, the, <laughs> and her face is as a result of being well fed. Uh, initially, <laughs> she would just be crying if she wasn't well fed, but right now she, she just ate and you know, she's sleeping so peacefully all because of people like you, Miss Sabrina and the program and that are helping parents like us and helping us to sleep at night. And I will say this, that for the first time in the longest time, we were finally able to like catch some sleep I'm like, okay, she's learning how we were taught. And now she's like sleeping the amount that she's supposed to sleep. And my husband has been able to catch some sleep as well. So we are just yeah. so blessed. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It was wonderful to come in and meet Sabrina and yeah. have her kind of show us the mm -hmm. ropes on yeah. how to get started. And it once she taught us how to do it, mm -hmm. um, it was just natural. Yeah, it was it almost was. like, how didn't I understand this? It's sort of how yeah. Veronica felt. Because as soon as it was latching properly, she was just like, wow, this is exactly how it works. Mm -hmm. Because mom and baby, they're just designed to work in mm -hmm. that synchronicity that way. Yeah. But when you've never done it before, it can be a little bit confusing and daunting. And it's like, why isn't this working? Mm -hmm. But But she totally had the key and she unlocked it yeah. for her. And it just was amazing. So things have changed for the better ever yeah. since, yeah. You've made it easier for us to, for me, especially to even want to feed her. When it's time to feed her, I don't like dredge my, I, I'm not like worried that it's going to hurt me. When it's time to feed her, I just grab her and I can just put her to the breast and she's like instantly eating. And that brings peace to our home, you know? <laughs> and the fact that our baby is finally able to, you know, enjoy what is naturally meant for her to enjoy is just truly a blessing. So thank you again. And I think that's all we have to share for now. Thank you so much. And You're Chair Kafori, she's going to be so mad because she <laughs> loves, she's knowing that she missed seeing your baby and we got to see your baby. So thank you for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. She's always available to make an appearance. Thank you, <laughs> All right, and I think, is it Nikisha up next? Yes, thank you. Hello, my name is Nikisha Killings. I am um, an International Board Certified Lactation Consultant, like a few of the folks who've been mentioned today or introduced themselves today. I'm also a, what's called a perinatal equity strategist, and so my work is in um, educating folks to be better providers uh, when it comes to supporting the birthing and breastfeeding period. Um, happy World Breastfeeding Week and National Breastfeeding Month in the United States. We're very, very excited about what's uh, happening. I am here to uh, announce a fantastic town hall event that's happening today at 11.30 a.m. 
I will be talking about implicit bias in birthing and breastfeeding. What we know for sure is that uh, families of color in this country are not breastfeeding at the rates uh, that uh, their uh, white counterparts are. And there are a number of factors that contribute to that. But one of them is provider bias and the level of care that providers are providing to people of color. And so I'm excited to talk with uh, Multnomah County about how we can dismantle, how we can address, identify and address our own biases so we can show up better and support fam families in their breast and chest feeding goals. That is the work at hand. It's a huge, huge undertaking. But as you can see, there are folks already in Multnomah County doing this tremendously, meeting families where they are, doing a fantastic job. My job is nearly already done because I'm seeing the great work that's already happening. I just want to encourage more lactation supporters and birth workers within ears reach to make sure that they too are dismantling their own biases and showing up for families in ways that are respectful and humble and helping them to reach their breast and chest feeding goals today and moving forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Nikisha. And Sabrina, I have that uh, someone's going to read the proclamation. Is that correct? Yes. Good morning again. That will be me. And good morning again, commissioners. Sabrina Vilmane reading the proclamation for 2022, or our breastfeeding proclamation. Before the Board of County Commissioners, Proclaiming August 1st through 7th, 2022 as World Breastfeeding Week in Multnomah County, Oregon. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioners finds, one, August is National Breastfeeding Month, an initiative designed to celebrate, support, and promote awareness of the benefits of breastfeeding. Two, the World Breastfeeding Week campaign aims to inform, anchor, engage, and galvanize action on breastfeeding and related issues. Three, Black Breastfeeding Week is an initiative intended to celebrate and encourage Black women to breastfeed. Four, racial inequalities in breastfeeding rates persist and are the result of barriers in healthcare, employment, and community settings, as well as racial and ethnic discrimination. Five, Multnomah County recognizes the physical and mental benefits of breastfeeding for both babies and mothers, as well as its importance of reducing racial disparities in healthcare and birth outcomes for babies. Six, Multnomah County recognizes the importance of having employer-focused breastfeeding as employers that provide workplace lactation support experience, and impress, which is an impressive return on investment, including lower health care costs, absenteeism, and turnover rates, and improved morale, job satisfaction, and productivity and breastfeeding is economical, providing its benefits at little to no cost and providing a safe, renewable food source, especially critical during natural disaster and emergency situations. Seven, Multnomah County is committed to establishing a breastfeeding medicine healing and training center dedicated to improving the health outcomes and infant mortality rates of mother baby dyads of color by providing access to culturally supported evidence-based lactation consultant provider services for women of color in Oregon. Eight, promoting diversity in the lactation field and applauding the work of community breastfeeding champions is very important and Black Breastfeeding Week provides the opportunity to encourage government agencies, community-based organizations, and academic institutions to share this message and work together to engage in equity efforts in their community. The Multnomah County Board of Commissioners proclaim, proclaims 
August 1st through 7th, 2022 as World Breastfeeding Week in Multnomah County, Oregon in recognition and celebration of the importance of breastfeeding in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. All right, uh, let's hear from our board. We'll start with Commissioner Myron. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, wow, uh, this was just such an amazing uh, presentation and just wonderful to, to see all of you and hear from all of you and learn uh, even more about the incredible work of REACH uh, and that you all do and have experienced in our community. Um, just, uh, I'm gonna go through and thank each of you because you, you all provided such, um, such inspiring um, information and uh, some of your stories uh, as well. So Veronica, I, I really appreciated your introducing um, all of this, this whole panel and um, talking about the need to honor and celebrate chest and breastfeeding for black communities, indigenous communities, immigrant communities, um, all of our diverse communities. And um, one thing I wanna hear more about at some point, it can be another point, but follow up on, you mentioned, I think, the Chest and Breastfeeding Medicine Center for Holistic Healing and Advocacy, this groundbreaking center. That sounds so exciting and um, just wanna learn lots and lots more. Um, and Sabrina, Wow, thank you for sharing um, some highlights uh, and really elevating, telling us more about what REACH is, why we need to care so much and elevate black breastfeeding and um, those linkages. The work REACH does, um, you know, sort of the three aspects of that work and um, breastfeeding and the connection to the work on nutrition. Um, and I love seeing the, I loved hearing about and then the visual of the mobile tents, <clears throat> the breastfeeding tents, those were awesome. So um, that is great. And um, there, there's just so much, there's just so much there talking about the incredible partnerships. I mean, that is just one of the um, great things about REACH is the way, I mean, it really is reaching out, that kind of engagement and partnership with community and just the whole um, array of organizations and communities that you partner with to do this work was really, really inspiring. Um, and Cherish, you're talking about some of those partnerships as well and particularly um, highlighting Rockwood Rising's breastfeeding space, which is just super cool. And, um, you know, in that partnership with the city of Gresham and, uh, and also the Port of Portland. And then Veronica and Ted. So first of all, having Ted there points to the importance of including men in this work, and I love how you elevated that. And, you know, aside from the amazingness of seeing the ba your baby there, which was just a joy. Um, <clears throat> I really, I really appreciated Veronica, your, say your comment saying that finally you were able to breastfeed your baby without being in tears. And as someone who kind of had some similar experiences there, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, it's, it's difficult enough to be a new mom and <clears throat> trying to figure out all these things out and try to be, try to do the best for your baby. And, you know, breastfeeding is such a, seems like such a key thing. It should be obvious. Everyone around seems to be perfectly breastfeeding their babies. And um, it can make you just feel so challenged and there can be physical and emotional pain associated with figuring it out. And what REACH is doing and with these programs is to empower you and partner with you and support you in, um, in making this process work. And so I love that you spoke to this and as in Ted's comment, 
the key to unlocking the mystery. And so it's great to see the impact that had on you and your baby. So, and, and Nikisha, it sounds like it's going to be a phenomenal town hall today and um, look forward to learning about more of your work and the implicit bias and um, how to approach that and things we can do, um, even legislative fixes that we can do here. So, I mean, so much fostering this community culture, the work that you do, and using this proclamation to elevate that work and move it forward and, and highlight it um, here today. Truly inspiring, and thanks to all of you and the whole teams, and Charlene um, for all that work. Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Vice Chair Stegman. Um, thank you all so much. This just has been a wonderful, wonderful proclamation and presentation. Um, you know, there's so much to appreciate. I, I, I thank you all of you for all of the work that you do and for bringing this forward. I want to particularly thank Veronica and Ted for being here. There's as much as we learn about our programs, there's nothing quite like hearing from people who have been served by them to, to really understand the impact that they have. Um, it is always a winning strategy to bring a baby. So thank you for bringing your very beautiful baby um, so we could we could see see them as well. And you know, I like Commissioner Myron, I, I have my own memories of the challenges of breastfeeding, um, including Veronica, I think you, you talked about dread and there was a time because of challenges that I dreaded it and there's nothing really worse for a mom to go through than to dread this, this very basic, beautiful part of nurturing her child. So thank you for highlighting that and, and highlighting the fact that there are things we can do about it, right? It's, it's not, I, I think it can feel hopeless um, as if it's never gonna change. And, and the work that this team does is to change that. Um, I also think of the challenge about uh, continuing to breastfeed when you go back to work, or if you're working and if you go back to work. And so I wanna, really, really appreciate the focus on employers and changing culture and employment and, and making sure that employers understand how important it is to provide um, comfortable, safe spaces for people to, to chest and breastfeed. So I really, really appreciate that strategy. Um, the community partnerships, engaging, engaging dads and men, so vital. So, uh, you know, again, Ted, another thank you for, for your partnership with Veronica and for your showing up here today. Uh, that just absolutely seems crucial as well. Um, so much wonderful work. I guess one, one question, and I think it's implicit in, in all of the strategies that you're pursuing, but it, if someone could talk a little bit about, in terms of data that, um, you know, illustrates what the barriers are for people who want to chest and breastfeed. I can think of many, you know, not understanding of how important it is, um, cultural stigma and discomfort, you know, uh, challenges going back to work. But I'm curious, is, is, there, is there research on what the most significant barriers are? And if, if someone wants to get back to me, that's totally fine too. Commissioner, we will definitely get back to you in regards to Multnomah County, but Ms. Nakisha will share some national statistics. Perfect, thank you. Sure, I, there are numerous barriers to success and a lot of it uh, depends upon which community you're talking to or talking about uh, exactly. But if we're talking about um, black breastfeeding, I know that's been highlighted quite a bit today. Certainly there are barriers um, that are systemic in nature um, in terms of uh, systems not set up for you know paid leave and for it to even be easy for one to nurse um, or pump for babies uh, at work um, and store their milk and take it home. Um, there's certainly not systemic, not enough systemic allowances available at a federal level and down taking care of families in that way. We've talked about racism and uh, data supports. There's absolutely bias in ways that is um, clearly outlined in the way that folks are presented with information around infant feeding, the level of information, the accuracy of it, um, all of that uh, matters. And then there's also some sort of generational and cultural um, factors that impact um, black breastfeeding, specifically uh, dating generations back um, to U.S. slavery, quite frankly, and the way that 
many, many uh, mothers were forced to feed others babies to the detriment of their own. Forced separations, we know that's sort of a theme, a running theme in American history. Um, up to present time, forced separations has touched Native families, Latinx families as well. All of that uh, impacting families' autonomy and ability to make the choices that are uh, right for them and take care of their babies and feed their babies in ways that are right for them has shifted uh, cultural dynamics in a way that are slow to come back. We're slow to trust medical establishment oftentimes because of so many uh, things that have happened in the history of this country. Many, many, many factors influence where we are today. Given that, I'm always impressed that the disparities aren't greater. And I think that speaks to the resilience and persistence of families who are dedicated to making sure their babies are fed optimally by any means necessary. Thank you so much, Nikisha. That was um, really powerful, and uh, uh, thank you. You know, and, and those those systemic issues. I appreciate the fact that this team is looking at legislation because some of those can be addressed through legislation. Um, the cultural cultural pieces may be much harder, but um, we absolutely should be tackling every every avenue that we can. So thank you, and thank you all for being here and for the proclamation. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you, everyone, um, for the proclamation. Nikisha, I, I, I agree. Thank you so much. I think um, knowing the where the challenges of today actually stem from help us um, address the problems on a, on a deeper and better level than, than if we don't know that information. So I really appreciate you sharing that today. Um, and for all your work, I think the town hall is going to be great. And I'm... Um, I'm really excited about the idea, <clears throat> excuse me, of the implicit bias bill um, that's, that would be moving forward in the legislature. I'm, I'm interested to learn more about that. Um, um, Sabrina and Cherish, thank you guys so much for the work that you do for being here today um, and for really addressing um, a, a really critical need in our communities for, um, for breastfeeding, especially supporting um, black mothers, black parents, black families um, with, the, with the needs, because you look at, I, I'd be interested to know the Multnomah County, um, some of the Multnomah County information too, but I know, you know, statistically there's like a, you know, like a 30% difference in breastfeeding rates. And so the fact that we're addressing it so strongly that this proclamation is part of lifting up um, the importance of breastfeeding and the work that is being done to support black families is really important. Um, I did also want to just um, give a shout out to um, Senator Jeff Merkley, who has been a national leader around breast breastfeeding legislation. He, um, there was a bill that was um, here in um, Oregon when he was in the in the House, and then now as a senator, he's worked at a national level to really help support breastfeeding at the workplace. And I think that's you know we talk about the the Rockwood um, rising breastfeeding space, which is really important because. It's a way of not just normalizing breastfeeding, but making it convenient, supporting it. And I think we need to have that um, at many more um, locations in our community and definitely at workplaces too. Um, and, you know, I was just thinking, you know, everyone was, people were talking about their own challenges with breastfeeding. It's been over a decade now since I breastfed, but my sister still is. And we went camping and she was not with, not with my nephew, but um, so she was pumping. and. She was like, I mean, it, the way that she was pumping was like, she was in a bunk with like towels and sheets like blocking her from view just to like get this done. And it isn't, breastfeeding isn't always the most convenient thing, it isn't always the easiest thing, but it is such an important thing. And everything that we can do to help support um, people who are breastfeeding um, in, in so many ways is, um, is incredibly valuable. So I just have a lot of gratitude for the work that REACH is doing, that the work that WIC is doing. Thank you, Veronica, for your work as well. Um, and just I'm glad um, that we have this chance to do the proclamation. And um, uh, Veronica and Ted, thank you so much for having a baby. <laughs> I think every breastfeeding proclamation, well, maybe even every proclamation have, should have a baby there, but um, but definitely this one. Um, and that was just um, and that was just really special. So thank you for sharing your story with us as well. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> well, I echo uh, what's been said and want to thank Veronica, Sabrina, Cherish, uh, and uh, Ted and and Nikisha. Uh, you know, I think we're talking about normalizing uh, one of the most natural things in the world. Uh, but I also share, you know, the, the frustrations and memories that, that 
I had around breastfeeding. But so there's one thing to normalize it in society, but it's another thing to normalize it in in the parents' mind. Like because you think that like this is just supposed to be easy. Like this is just supposed to happen. It it never <laughs> works like that. And just knowing that there is support. Uh, for others who have gone through this that have, you know, the background and, and the education to really uh, support women who need that additional support. And I think that it's it's more women uh, than we think. And so I just want to, you know, have a shout out that if, if you're nursing and you're struggling, um, that's probably normal. <laughs> so, And that's why we have such great programs uh, by these wonderful uh, women in leadership to help support our community. So I just want to thank all of you for being here and always raising awareness about uh, the importance of nourishing our our community and our babies and our families and uh, it's just great to have you here all right marina would you please uh, take a roll call vote commissioner myron aye commissioner jayapal aye commissioner vega peterson aye vice chair stegman aye the proclamation is adopted yay, yay. So much. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. All right. Now is when we have time for board comments on non-agenda items. Uh, we will start with Commissioner Vega Peterson. Do you have any announcements or comments? Thank you, um, Vice Chair. I, I, the one comment that I can't, um, that I want to make, and I, and I, and I'm going to guess other folks here might be talking about too, is just I was, I know after. Um, the Supreme Court decision around abortion and the Roe v. Wade over, being overturned, um, a lot of us were feeling really uh, disenchanted, really um, you know, hit hard in terms of what kind of country we are, what's the future for women and other people who can have abortions in this um, country to have their own bodily autonomy. So the results that we saw this week in Kansas where there was a popular vote that supported the right for people to have um, access abortion care um, was such a light in the dark and, um, and such a real shot in the arm, I think, to the work that we're doing. And to me, it really underlined, you know, bodily autonomy, access to make decisions about your own health care um, choices is not a Republican issue. It's not a Democratic issue. This is just a human right. And the fact that we have a Supreme Court that is so um, out of line with where so many people in this country are is something that, you know, we're going to have to deal with. But I think for this week, you know, there is a lot to celebrate. and. Um, a lot to be said for the power of um, people to be able to express their own opinions and um, and that those opinions are ones that um, uphold not just democracy but really um, the equality of people and the and the importance of um, everybody having the right to make decisions about their own body so I was um, that was something that was really uplifting for me this week and I just wanted to share it thank you for sharing that yeah who, thank you thank you Kansas <laughs> uh, Commissioner Jayapal Thank you, Vice Chair Stegman. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Vega Peterson, for sharing that. Um, it absolutely was a bright spot, and it highlights, you know, obviously the importance of voting. We all know that it, that that vote made a difference in Kansas, but it made a difference nationwide. Um, so, uh, just really, really heartening news. And segueing from that to it's summer, so there are lots of events happening on the weekend, and one that I wanted to highlight is for Next Up, um, and it connects to that 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 issue of voting because, of course, what Next Up has been doing for the last 20 years is creating opportunities for young people to vote and to build power across Oregon. So they are celebrating their 20th birthday this Sunday, August 7th, um, from 1 to 4. Very honored to sponsor that and um, stop by picnic area number two to join the celebration. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Myron. Thank you. I, uh, too, was going to mention each of those things. Next up, i um, honored to sponsor, too, and look forward to uh, going on the roller coasters at Oaks Park. Um, still got it. And um, also just, you know, the highlighting the results of the vote in Kansas. And I, I mean, I, I actually cried when I heard about this and you're, you're exactly right this is it's not just Kansas this was for the whole country and um, anyway that just so such um, a wonderful result um, there, there have been just some good things uh, you know I was really thrilled to spend part of my Sunday last 
weekend at the grand opening of the bicycle and pedestrian Blumenauer Bridge. It was just an incredible ceremony full of joy. And, you know, this will serve as a vital connection across um, across I-84, connecting pedestrians and people biking between two of Portland's fastest growing neighborhoods, Lloyd and the Central East Side. So that was just wonderful. Go walk and bike and explore all of those exciting businesses there. Um, join constituents and frontline providers at the Southeast Uplift Community Engagement Evening on Houselessness, which was phenomenal, really highlighted sort of the sense of community, how many neighbors want to lend a helping hand um, for our unhoused neighbors. Um, that that true um, just support and sense of community was really evident. And then um, later that same evening, connecting with uh, Southwest neighbors and um, talked about and trained about how to interact with people experiencing a mental health crisis and what services and resources exist in the county and beyond to help in these intense situations. Um, one other cool um, and exciting event that I'm attending is um, the, and I encourage you all to attend, you may be, is the Word is Bond Community Showcase um, that's celebrating the conclusion of their Rising Leaders Internship Program. And uh, for 2022, Word is Bond, as we all know, but um, for those who don't, is an organization dedicated to rewriting the narrative between young black men and law enforcement through leadership development, critical dialogue, and engagement. That event is tomorrow, Friday, um, at 4.30 p.m. at New Song Community Church on Northeast MLK Junior Boulevard. Um, and it follows on really a, a very um, a wonderful lunch event that Commissioner Segman uh, was at th that also highlighted the, the wonderful work of so many of those young men. And um, finally, I know um, we are all uh, painfully aware that there's a huge number of unrepresented individuals in our justice system due to the lack of public defenders available to provide legal defense services. And that's, it's, it's unconscionable. Um, I've been in conversations with Carl McPherson, who's the executive director of Metropolitan Public Defenders, and learned that the Oregon Office of Public Defense has been working to create a plan that'll hopefully address this crisis, both in real time and some longer term solutions, and will be providing recommendations to the Oregon Public Defense Services Commission at the state. And I'll be circulating, talking to you about some information about this and available to answer any questions. And um, we'll be drafting a letter of support for um, these recommendations. I'm hoping that you all will take a look and agree to sign on to, um, to increase some funding and other approaches. So that's it. Thank you. All right, I don't have anything. Uh, thank you, everyone. This con concludes today's regular board meeting. There being no further business, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>